Kuznetsov class, project 1143.5, ship brief. Before we begin, I want to point out the phased array radars that are around the island on top of this uh, heavy aircraft carrying cruiser, as uh, designated by the Soviet Union. It is a phased array radar, uh, so it's pretty advanced for the time, uh, as we'll get into. Let's start at Nikta Complex in Crimea, Russia, 1982. Um, this could also be Crimea, Soviet Union, 1982, uh, but I just chose to call it Russia. Uh, a series of flight tests begin in Crimea here using this 12 degree ramp at this uh, you know, flight training center. This is where a lot of the pilots go to, uh, to learn to fly their plane, take off land, do basic aerial maneuvers, and also test new plane designs, engine modifications. It's a big testing complex. And this curious little ramp appears and uh, is published in a French magazine as uh, what are in the world of the Russians or the Soviet Union up to at this time. And they document Su-27s, which is a all-weather fighter, very advanced. Uh, Su-25 is a ground attack plane and MiG-29s, which is the old reliable, very Soviet uh, airplane, air superiority and air to ground, multi-purpose. So... The early testing had some failures and um, two attempts to construct, construct catapults like what the Americans used uh, were, were scrapped because of unreliability problems. Uh, they did have the technology to make catapults and make them work. They just didn't have either the craftsmanship or the management standards to maintain uh, consistent catapult pressure. And they didn't want to risk you know, planes and pilots to an inconsistent catapult. So they kind of scrapped the catapult idea and uh, stayed with the ski jump idea for their heavy aircraft carrying cruiser that was coming up. Uh, a plane that they had planned on operating off this Kuznetsov class was the Yak-38 VTOL. The VTOL had been in service for a long time, uh, operating on their Kiev class. And it could also operate on the Moskva, but it was all usually on the Kiev class. Uh, and it was much like a Russian or Soviet Union Harrier, at least in appearance, but the performance was terrible. Uh, for example, it had three engines, but two of the engines were for vertical takeoff and landing, and one engine was to push it forward. So it was extremely underpowered, guzzled a lot of fuel, and the one engine that pushed it forward couldn't push it forward fast enough to use the ski jump in the limited space they had on this aircraft carrier. And so uh, the Act 38 was only able to launch uh, with limited fuel load and basically no payload, which made it useless to the military. So they had to lighten the frame to try and get it airborne. Uh, and by doing that, they actually lost a plane. Uh, the pilot ejected fine, but the, the structure could not take the forces of this 12 degree ski jump with the lightened frame. So the Yak-38 would be regulated to serving on the Kiev class uh, aircraft carrying ships that use a vertical takeoff, much like our LHAs uh, in the United States Navy today. All right, so project 1143.5. Uh, the Kuznetsov will be constructed in the Crimean shipyards, uh, now called Dalian Shipbuilding, or uh, Black Sea Shipyard. Uh, the shipyard has had many names through uh, the Soviet Union and then into today. Uh, this aircraft carrying cruiser will have 12 surface-to-surface -surface missiles uh, in the bow, and we'll go over those. She also has 24 vertical launched uh, granite missile or gauntlet missiles carrying 192 total missiles. These are very short range, but highly accurate air defense missiles. Uh, 24 blocks. Uh, she's made out of 24 blocks. It's 24 sections or segments that when welded together will create the entire ship. Each one of those blocks is about uh, 1700 tons. Uh, she's divided. She has seven decks, but those seven decks are subdivided into 27 floors. So this thing is like a huge you know, imagine a hotel, essentially, if you uh, go from the top of the island all the way down to the keel, 27 floors. And she has two platforms, if you count the top side platform. Uh, the second platform is for airplanes. And she's also surprisingly covered in radar absorbent material. Uh, this was a fact that was classified for a long time, but it's in public circles now. So we can confirm that she did have radar absorbent material topside and on the sides of the hull as well. All right, the Black Sea Shipyard. Long history of this shipyard. It was founded way back in 1895. Um, she's been building warships since 1901, submarines since 1930. Uh, she has two main areas that cover more than 500 square acres, really big. 
Uh, they produce today. They produce tankers, trawlers, and usually uh, you know civilian vessels. But they have the capability of producing warships as well. In September 1982, the keel is laid on the Kuznetsov class and construction begins in the Black Sea. There'll end up being two of these and they're both built in the same shipyard. All right, by the numbers, what are we talking about? The Kuznetsov class, 350 meters long, so she's big, 72 meters wide, thick. She displaces 55,000 tons, which is comparable to the American carriers of the 1980s. Not today, by chance, but certainly of the 1980s, uh, she's comparable. She has four steam turbines that turn four screws, can produce 80,000 shaft horsepower, five-bladed screws. So she can really get up and move. She was actually measured at doing 32 knots. So unlike a lot of public sources, um, she can be pushed through the water 32 knots on her own power when all the steam generators are working. And this is a big problem with this that we're going to talk about a lot is the Achilles heel of this design is it was not designed to work in cold weather, despite the majority of Russian ports being in the Arctic climate and the steam uh, generators were extremely unreliable. Uh, there was a very few times when all eight of the, um, of the steam generators, there was two per steam turbine were actually operational but if they were operational she could go 8,500 miles between refuels because she is conventionally powered and she has almost 2,000 crewmen on board not counting the air wing uh, the air wing maintenance and pilots come as an additional and when you have the air wing on you also have staff so that's another you know 60 to 100 men with the admiral and all of his aides uh, so you could easily be over 2,000 crew with everybody on board she does have 12 of the SSN-19 shipwreck missiles in the bow. I'll show you those in a second. 192 of the SA-9 gauntlet missiles. That's for air defense. Very short range. Like It's like an eight-mile missile. So it's almost point defense. But it hits just about anything that it's shot at. It's a very accurate missile. It also has eight Kashtan Sea Wiz mounts uh, and six of the AK-630 uh, AA mounts, which can also be used for close-in weapons um, support. She has one UDAV ASW rocket launcher. This is only on hall one, by the way. And uh, that is an RBU 6000 that she can use to uh, keep submarines and torpedoes at bay. And uh, they also mentioned that it's designed for, uh, you know, swimmers too. like if they were in a port and they saw swimmers coming towards the ship, they could shoot these rockets into the water and persuade the swimmers to not get any closer than 6000 yards. She uh, can have 32 fixed wing aircraft. That's of the Su-27, uh, Su-25, and the, or the MiG-29, any combination of those up to 32, and 24 helicopters. So she has space in the hangar designed for both of these, and she can have that many on board at the same time. All right, this is a 19 shipwreck missile. We've talked about this a lot in all of our sub briefs that talk about uh, Soviet submarines and ships uh, it's designed in the 1970s it is a long-range anti-ship missile it is a uh, supersonic at 2.5 times the speed of sound at sea level which is really fast uh, she carries a huge high explosive warhead 750 kilograms or a 500 kiloton nuclear warhead and she's fired in groups of four or eight and the reason why that is is the missiles communicate with each other so four, eight, you could even do an additional four for 12, you know, and that'd be the whole battery. And there you can see the battery doors open on the bow. The, the, the hatches are part of the flight deck. So you can launch some airplanes, open up these hatches, launch some missiles, close them again and launch more airplanes. Very cool design. All right, the SA-9 Gauntlet SAM, it has, like I said, a 7.5 uh, mile range. It is a solid fuel rocket booster, radio controlled missile, and it's highly agile. That's, it's, it's hard to defeat if you're an incoming plane or a missile. Uh, they can be rapidly shot. You can see the launchers there on the right-hand side, one missile every three seconds, one after the other, and that's the radar tracker that directs the missile onto, onto targets. Uh, it can shoot down multiple targets too. Uh, it's, it's not limited to one at a time and carries 192 of these missiles. All right, here's the Cash Tan Sea Wiz and the AK-630 point defense weapons and also anti-air weapons. If you can get within ballistic range of these things, they can shoot you down. 
Um, the cash tan on the left has had many variants, but the Kuznetsov originally had the old 1980s variant. If you see pictures of the cash tan today, you'll see that it has additional barrels added on and even some missile launchers added on to it. But this is the older one before those modifications. It's used for point defense. It can spit out 9,000 rounds per minute. That's counting both barrels firing at the same time. And it is both radar and optically guided. The uh, AK-630 is a uh, rapid fire six barrel. You know, it's almost like the American Phal or Phalanx Sea Whiz. Uh, looks a little different, but operates the same. It is radar guided uh, by Bass Drum Radar and shoots 5,000 rounds per minute. It can shoot in bursts or it can shoot continuously uh, are the modes. And they can take manual control of these as well. But normally they're just left in automatic uh, engagement mode. All right, here's the UDAV uh, one uh, ASW rocket. There you can see uh, a picture of it. And it does have an auto loader from the decks below. It has 10 barrels and has a range of about 6,000 meters. It's an anti-submarine or anti-torpedo. You know, it can do either one of those and has up to six reloads on board. So it shoots all 10 rockets is one shot. It can't shoot like one or two rockets. You either shoot the whole thing, the whole kit, or you don't shoot it at all. So you shoot all 10 rockets, it bursts out, it goes out 6,000 yards or less. You can dial in the range to maximum range about 6,000 yards. And um, it can break apart an incoming weapon. That's part of the purpose of it. But you would have to get very lucky in guessing uh, how long it takes to reach the the 6,000 yard point and where that torpedo is going to be on what bearing you'd have to kind of figure that out, which they probably could. Uh, they claim that they, that's part of the mission of this weapon. It's not just an anti submarine weapon. It's an anti torpedo weapon as well. All right, let's talk about the aircraft on board. These things, the SU 27 K is also called the SU 33. So I'll be referring to this as the SU 33 uh, for, for the rest of this, but just know it's a modification of the SU 27. It's fourth generation air superiority fighter. Primary mission is for fleet defense, but fleet defense by air superiority. Um, it has look down, shoot down capability, which for the time was the latest thing, uh, very similar to the uh, F-15 in terms of capability. Uh, infrared search track had a 62 mile range. That was a big advantage that this thing had very similar to the uh, camera on board the F-14, the American plane. Uh, but this one could do an infrared search for targets, which was a passive search. So the target didn't realize it was being locked up up to 62 miles away and then engaged. It has a single 30 millimeter cannon and 10 hard points for weapons. Can carry lots of, lots of weapons. Another airplane or aircraft was the KA-27 Helix ASW helicopter. Now, this the KA-26 Helix is a jack-of-all-trades helicopter. It can do much more than just ASW, but its primary mission is ASW. So the coaxial rotor uh, maritime helicopter has a range of uh, 430 nautical miles. It can do everything, everything from supply missions, bringing stores on board the ship and moving it to other ships to electronic surveillance. Uh, it can go rescue down pilots or people in the water. But it also does ASW, which carries usually two torpedoes or one nuclear depth bomb. Uh, and then other variants. There is a, a land attack variant of the KA-27 uh, that carries rockets and anti-tank missiles. But again, those are not the primary missions. Uh, usually, whenever you saw this in the air, it was uh, had a dipping sonar and was looking for submarines. Here's the K-29, or sorry, the MiG-29K Fulcrum participated in sea trials and is certified to operate on board as well. Um, this is not fly by wire. This is very much an old school airplane, manually trimmed, twin engine, multi-role fighter. It does have the infrared search while track capability, just like the SC-27, which is nice. Now the 30 millimeter cannon only has 150 rounds and it fires so fast, it's only like two seconds worth of engagement. So you can get maybe two short bursts out of the cannon on board. I imagine a lot of that is due to weight because I imagine the ammunition is very heavy. So... And plus, where are you going to put it? You know, there's no place for it to, to be in the plane. And it has six hard mounts for weapons, as you see there on the bottom of it. Now, this did operate in the Russian Navy, uh, but also uh, it's operated in, in, in navies around the world, specifically the Indian Navy. They love this plane and they operate it off their carriers all the time. 
And here's the SU-25 UTG Frogfoot. This is a special variant of the Frogfoot created specifically to operate off the Kuznetsov. It is a very slow, subsonic, single-seat ground attack aircraft carrier. It doesn't look anything like the American A-10, but the mission is very similar. It has eight hard points and carries a wide variety of ammunition, or munitions, rather. Over 500 nautical mile range, so pretty fuel efficient, but that's because it's a slow uh, airplane. Um, five were operational after the fall of the Soviet Union, but they have replaced them since then. And according to Russian sources, there are 10 of these operational right now because the original Kuznetsov in 2021 is still operational. Yeah, this, this aircraft carrier is still around. All right, here she is. The Admiral Kuznetsov, Hall 1, the ship of many names. And this was really confusing in the 80s because to people outside, you know, top naval circles, top brass and things like that, we thought that she, that the Soviet Union was building like four of these things. Now, they did plan on building two, but they gave the first ship like four different names. So her keel is laid on September 1st, 1982. And at the ceremony, they call her the Riga. So we're building the Riga now. But just a few months later, in November of the same year, it becomes the Leonid Brezhnev. So it was a little confusing because we thought maybe they were they had laid keels on two different ships. It's very common to build two ships of the same class at the same time in the same shipyard. Um, it's more efficient that way. Anyway, so she's launched in 1984 as the, as the Leonid Brezhnev. Uh, but three years later, before she's commissioned, the designer in a interview calls her the Tbilisi. So this is now the third name of, of the ship. So November 1989, sea trials and aircraft certification are complete. Uh, in October 1990, the next year, they renamed the ship for the last time under the Soviet Union flag as Admiral of the Soviet Union Fleet Kuznetsov, referring to Admiral Kuznetsov of, um, of, of old. It's, it's an honor of him. And it is commissioned in December, uh, Christmas Day, 1990, you know, one year to the day uh, before the fall of the Soviet Union. So Admiral Kuznetsov in 1992, uh, Soviet Union is gone. So it's just the uh, Russia now. And so the name is shortened to Admiral Kuznetsov. They took the Soviet Union out of the name. And so I guess you could call that another renaming. It is now Admiral Kuznetsov. Same ship the entire time. In 1993, though, uh, design flaws result in the water pipes freezing in Arctic conditions because uh, Crimea and Ukraine are no longer part of the of Russia, right? The, the Soviet Union's gone. So they take this ship and they move it up to the Northern Fleet up in the Kola Peninsula. And it's not designed to operate in Arctic conditions. So they have to literally shut down a lot of the piping to keep the pipes from bursting because the water's freezing inside the piping. Therefore, a lot of systems like the bathrooms, showers, and toilets are not getting water. So uh, a lot of the facilities for the crew do not work, or at least don't have water. So a bathroom without water isn't much. It's just a room at that point. And so life on board this thing is pretty tough because they don't have all the facilities that they're supposed to have for the crew of almost 2,000 people. So 1994, uh, it's found that the boilers have a high failure rate. These are the steam generating boilers. There's eight of them on board and they're always failing. They're, they're leaking, they're, uh, they're inefficient. Um, they don't, it's rare that all eight are operational at the same time. But despite all that, in 1995, Russia declares the Kuznetsov operational. Yay. In 1996, she begins her first deployment, but with a repair tug. And every time, even today, whenever this ship goes to sea, she's always uh, accompanied with a support tug in case something breaks down and she needs to be tugged back to port, the, the nearest friendly port. After that med deployment in 1996, she goes into dock for repairs. And in 1998, she's declared inactive. So they're running out of money. 1990s were really tough in Russia. And uh, they just don't have the money to repair all the problems with the ship. Piping needs to be redesigned and re rehung so it doesn't freeze. The boilers, they need to figure out what the problem is. You can't rip the boilers out of this thing without dismantling the majority of the ship. 
So they're like, how do we repair these boilers or fix them without actually changing them out? They're trying to figure all that stuff out. They can't afford to do it. So they just call her inactive for a few years in 2000. It's a new millennia. It's a new day. Everyone's got big dreams. So they Russia reactivates her for war games in the Barents Sea. And sadly, that's the war games where we lost the curse K141. Uh, she does participate in the search, though. She's present uh, as part of the search. She pulls back into port and can continues her repairs. That war game was more of a, you know, show, hey, you know, Russia's back. You know, it was a power move and uh, or display, you know, but it was really hollow, to be honest with you. In 2004, the steam turbines are declared repaired and the piping has been replaced throughout the ship so it doesn't freeze anymore. The crew's bathrooms and other facilities have water again, 2004. So she goes out and does war games in the North Atlantic this time. This is one of the largest amphibious war games we've Russia's done since the fall of the Soviet Union. This one was closely tracked by a lot of NATO nations. Um, they were simulating the amphibious landing of what we believe to be Iceland, but they weren't doing it to Iceland itself, as that would have been very provocative. Uh, really big war game, though. In 2005, the next year, uh, she lost an Su-33 over the side during North Atlantic operations. Uh, we believe this was due to a... Um, a cable failure an arrestor cable had failed because the airplane had come in once to land and uh, hit the cable, but missed it. And instead of repairing or examining the cable, they just reset it. And on the second one, she captured the cable, but the cable didn't have any tension and spooled off the deck of the ship with the airplane. So, but the pilot ejected and he was fine, but they lost the airplane uh, to, to that cable failure. In 2007, she deployed to the Med. In 2008, she's doing war games again in the Barents Sea. The following year, she's deploying to the Med again. So we're beginning to see really strong operational tempo once they get, the, once they get these boilers figured out and the plumbing works again. So she's deploying about every other year, all the way through 2012 and 2014, always to the Med. In 2012, she did lose propulsion in the Med and had to be towed back to port. They, uh, they towed her all the way back to uh, the Kola Peninsula. A little bit embarrassing there. In 2016, she deploys to the Met again, but this time she operates off the coast of Syria. And this is kind of a big deal because Syria is a hotbed of, uh, of attacks and going through a civil war with the Islamic State versus the uh, authoritarian state in charge of Syria. Russia's backing the, um, the leaders of Syria in this, and they launch airstrikes into Syria against the Islamic State targets that ironically are being backed by the United States. Um, so that's a proxy war really between Russia and the United States there in Syria at this time, 2016, one of the SU 33s was lost while landing due to a failed arresting wire and uh, 420 airstrikes were conducted during the entire deployment. Uh, 2017 it entered refit modernization period in Murmansk. And uh, that's where she is today. So she's going through a major overhaul. Uh, that has been delayed due to many complications, including the dry dock you see her in in this photo. Uh, this, this dry dock flooded and sank, and uh, the boat was left, you know, you know, floating above a sunk dry dock. So they've managed to move uh, uh, the Kuznetsov to a pier, and I think by now they have her back in another dry dock, was the last that I had heard. Um, yeah, but this dry dock, it looks like it's in really rough shape even in this photo, and it turns out they were using... I guess this dry dock was leaking the whole time, like even in this photo, but they had pumps on board that could dewater the lower bilges as the water leaked in. So they were able to maintain positive buoyancy. Well, those pumps eventually failed and uh, that's why it sunk, but she is an overhaul today. She's scheduled to be uh, out of overhaul by 2024. So we'll see what happens in 2024. Maybe we'll revisit this story then and see what kind of new equipment she has. All right, let's talk about Hull 2. Hull 2 is an interesting story. This is the Varyag. Uh, Killed late in December 1985, uh, launched November 1988, and uh, 1992 construction was halted after the fall of Soviet Union. So this thing is only about 70% complete, and that's just based on how it looks on the outside. Nobody's getting on board to do any inspections. They're just estimating 70%. So, but it's in Crimea, which at that time is part of the Ukraine. So the Ukraine starts shopping it around. They're like, hey, we got this half finished ship. You know, Russia, do you want to buy it? And Russia's like, we got no money. So they, they offer it to China. They're like, hey, China, you, know, you want an aircraft carrier? It's almost done. China 
turned it down too. And even did India and India is big on buying Russian ships and stuff, but they, India turned it down as well. India is going to build their own aircraft carriers in the future. And so in 1998, a couple years later, a, a private, if you want to, this is in major air quotes, private company from China comes in and offers to buy the Hulk uh, for a floating casino. They're going to cool this, turn this into one of the coolest floating casinos in China. And uh, they, they do the deal between 1998 and 2001. And then finally, the hull starts to be towed to China. They had to get special permission from Turkey to transfer the Bosporus Strait because of the treaty they have there. This thing exceeds uh, the uh, tonnage to, to go through the strait. And because the Soviet Union is no longer a thing, uh, that's why it applied to the Varyag and not the uh, Admiral Kuznetsov. So they had to get special permission. And that took a couple years. Um, but they finally got it and they're, tu they're tugging it. It's a two year journey all the way around the world to China. So after arriving in China, about 20 months later, costing over 120 million American dollars, uh, it is immediately confiscated by the people's liberation army and Navy and towed to Dalian, China, which is a Northern China, um, and they begin turning this into the Liaoning, which is China's first aircraft carrier. That's right. So they let the private businessmen spend the money, uh, buy the hull, pay for the shipping, essentially. And the moment it arrives, they arrest him and ca and confiscate the, uh, the, the, the hull and imprison him for smuggling, weapon smuggling. <laughs> so, so much for this thing being a casino. Uh, it's really, really shady because... Everybody thought that it was a front. Um, you know, the company was only a front to buy the aircraft carrier in the first place. Uh, and that's essentially what it was. But they ended up, you know, uh, arresting the original per 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 purchaser uh, at the same time. So, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. But that's the way China rolls. You know, they don't need any loose ends uh, writing books and telling stories of what the real story is behind the scenes. The, the reality is China just got its first aircraft carrier. Yeah. So it goes into dry dock in uh, for 10 years and uh, comes out in 2012 as China's first aircraft carrier, X Varyag, uh, currently called the Leoning, the Type 001. So what kind of airplanes are China going to operate off this thing? Well, they operate the J-15T, NATO named Flanker X-2. And this is just one variant of the J-15. There's a bunch of different types of this one plane. But it is a fourth generation all-weather multi-role fighter. Uh, it's based on the Su-33. You know, it's basically a, a Chinese copy of the Su-33. In 2009, it uh, begins flight testing, including the ski jump takeoff. That works fine. 2012, they actually begin operations with the PLAN fleet. Uh, the 30 millimeter cannon still limited to 150 rounds, much like the MIG, and uh, 12 external hard points. So they've added uh, a few more hard points for weapons and uh, a variety of air to air and air to ground munitions. This is, like I said, a multi role fighter, so they can put just about anything on it. And so a big problem with this plane uh, that I should bring up here is the engines are extremely unreliable. Um, this, this plane has been grounded multiple times uh, for engine problems. Um, they, 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 they can build the engines, but they just can't maintain them or keep them running reliably. And that is a real downside to this particular, uh, aircraft. Well, here she is in all of her glory, painted up all nice, looking very Chinese. Now this is a 2013, uh, she's stationed out of Yuchi Naval base near Hung Dao. That's up North, Northern China. Uh, steam turbine continues to fail, causing damage. They've never uh, figured out the steam turbine problems like they did supposedly with the Admiral Kuznetsov class, you know, the first one, Hull one. The Russians figured it out. China still scratching their heads on how they're going to make the uh, power plant work reliably. But she did deploy into the Western Pacific in 2016 and uh, to the South China Sea in 2018, trying to make a show of force in those areas. And most recently, as the time of this recording, she has deployed near Okinawa and Japan's islands, island chains. So she is operational, you know, sailing in that region, you know, Western Pacific, uh, showing the Chinese flag. And she's operational today, despite all of her power plant problems. Uh, and pr presumably the piping still freezes in very cold weather as well. 
uh, until they get those two things figured out, she will be unreliable. But know that she is commissioned and she is operational. So yeah, man, my final my final thoughts on this. This is uh, one of those Cold War icons. This this thing was a legend in like the American cultures, you know, for for naval fans. And even after I joined the Navy, you know, tracking the coups nets off was one of the things that every sonarman wanted to be able to say that he did. But because they couldn't get it to run properly, it was very rare that she went to sea. Uh, you know, before the two thousands anyway, in the nineteen nineties. So it was very hard to get her get her on sonar. But everybody wanted to see what she was about because with sonar, we can look inside of her essentially and see how all the reduction gears work and how the boilers work just through sound. And uh, that's a really major part of our job. And so we were looking forward to tracking her. But sadly, she didn't go to sea very much uh, when I was in a position to track her myself. So propulsion problems haunted the design for decades and continue uh, for China even today. Uh, failure to anticipate Arctic operating conditions is a major oversight by the designers. They should have thought of that because Russia has a lot of Arctic ports and they just didn't even seem to consider that whenever they built it. Uh, so after extensive refit modernization, she did see high tempo operations in the 2000s. That's Hull 1. Uh, she's meant to be an example of what a great nation can do, but became an example of what a great nation can do wrong. And what I mean by that statement is that... Uh, it had all sorts of problems that were probably bureaucratic in nature, like the piping and certainly the prime mover, the engines, like the, the men installing the steam generators clearly either were not trained or did not know what they were doing. And it was probably some sort of engineering failure as well, compounding the problems with the propulsion of this, of this ship. It's often considered a cursed ship by superstitious sailors. Uh, a lot of sailors can be very superstitious, even if, even if they're not religious. So being assigned to the ship uh, wasn't necessarily something a, a sailor wanted uh, because of all the problems, because uh, any problems that happen with the ship, whether it's the sailor's fault or not, you know, it still impacts his life. You know, morale on board the ship is very low. Uh, you spend a lot of time, you know, in maintenance, which is difficult for everybody. Even if your equipment is not the equipment that's broken, everybody's having a bad day when you can't go to sea. And the captain is, you know, walking around the ship, finding things for you to do. And so being on board a cursed ship or a ship that spends a lot of time in maintenance is not good for anybody. And China acquiring Hull 2 is really quite a story where they allowed this businessman to do all the work and pay for everything. And whenever it is complete and he's getting ready to turn this Hull 2 ship into a casino, they seize it and then they just throw him in jail. <laughs> and that's how that's how China rolls. It is really a shocking shocking story that uh, I encourage you to learn more about. If you're curious about that, China does not play whenever it comes to its citizens. You know, if China wants something, it takes it from you. And if you complain about it, they throw you in jail. Yeah. So that's the story of Hull too. All right. Well, that's it for the Kuznetsov class ship brief, kind of a short one because they only had two hauls, but a very interesting, I think story. Uh,